Well, hey there, gang, and welcome back to another video here on Joe Chem. Okay, gang, in this video, you know, if you're if you just watched the last one, of course, when we talk about oxidation, we have to talk about reduction. So today we're going to talk about, or today, in this video, we're going to talk about reducing sugars. And luckily, this is chemistry you already know. You've known this probably since OCHEM 1, but if it's new, well then, hey, we're going to learn something new today. So... I brought two familiar friends, D-glucose and D-fructose, because in reducing sugars, it doesn't matter if you're doing this with an aldose or if you're doing it with a ketose. They both apply, but I want to show you, not maybe the catch, but, you know, we've been very sugar-minded, you know? I want to make sure we don't forget some things uh, associated with this reduction reaction. So, yeah, we're bringing um, back sodium borohydride. And our workup is going to be water. And I know maybe from, you know, OCHEM 1, you're used to seeing ethanol be the partner here. But there's a very good reason for that, and I'll touch on that. Uh, but when you have, you know, your sodium borohydride, your water, remember, this is just your source of H-. minus, A very, you know, not crazy, not super aggressive, LAH level aggression uh, source of, you know, hydride. All you're going to do here is this thing will attack your carbonyl carbon, electrons kick up onto your oxygen, that creates an O minus, and you'll steal a proton from water to work up. So again, you're going from, you're going from an aldehyde to an alcohol. So your product will just look like this for an aldose. So just don't make sure, just make sure you don't miss redraw your sugar that you're doing it. So essentially it's the same deal, but instead, you know, instead of oxidizing just the top, we're just reducing just the top, right? Now, if you do this with defructose, this is why I wanted to bring this up for ketosis, ketosis, ketosis. <laughs> Remember that these are trigonal planar carbons. So when you attack the ketone, right, this is not an issue because we're terminal up here, but when you attack this position right here, you are going to create a stereo center, right? And I know it's less less obvious because we're looking at this on a Fisher projection, and it, maybe if you weren't given this as a Fisher projection, you would remember this. But it's very easy to lose fact the the you know lose this in translation when you're just looking at a Fisher projection. There's no you know after the fact this right here that oxygen is either going to be on the right as an OH or it is going to be on the left as an OH. And of course, because this is trigonal planar, no preference for attack, you're just going to estimate that it's going to happen in a 50-50 quantity. So you're going to get two products here, right? Your top and bottom were already the same, but instead of having that carbonyl here, you're going to have one product where you have the OH on the right, and then everything else stays the same. You still got the left, got the right, you got the right, as well as... The other product, and yes, I'm going to, maybe if you were thinking to yourself, a very particular term that starts with an E, because I'm going to, we'll be able to use that. So we got here, 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 and here. So essentially, right, you have two products, as assuming that you'll have a 50-50 mixture of both. They are not enantiomers because they only differ in their stereochemistry at one position. So they are diastereomers, but in sugar world, remember... Because we only differ stereochemistry at this position, you can call these both, you know, a pair of, you know, they to each other are epimers, okay? Cool. So, gang, this is definitely going to be a shorter video. Stick with me. I have one concept question I want to kind of go through. Um, it's something I wanted to include on the oxidation one, but it fits nicely here. Uh, and it does, does also apply to the oxidation thing. So we will talk about that. Uh, the other last thing, the reason why... Uh, you don't want ethanol here, is that you will unintentionally maybe form a glycoside. Uh, and if you're wondering what a glycoside is and you're watching the video at this point and you haven't gotten deeper into the series, well, then check out the glycoside video and you'll see what I mean. However, I'll clean this up. I'll wipe this up. And we'll do one quick question and put the reduction of sugars to bed. Okay, gang, to close this video out, we have one kind of concept question which relates to not only just reduction, but you'll see oxidation as well. So the question is, explain why a solution of, and I said alpha, beta, I guess what I could have just done was say, you know, D, 
glucopyranose, which, you know, is this. I'll just leave the anomeric position, you know, ambiguous, but it being deep glucose means it is the all equatorial sugar. So I know this is what I am dealing with. So explain why a solution of this is converted 100% to this reduction product that we see there, which looks like D glucose, except instead of having the aldehyde at the top, we have the alcohol, which makes sense because we have our NADH4 and water workup right there. So the idea is, right, this question is cloaked in the fact that you don't reduce these rings. They're not, you know, they don't respond to the sodium boral hydride. But remember, this ring, you know, the ring form is in a heavily favored equilibrium with itself to the straight chain form of, you know, the straight chain representation Fischer projection form, sorry, I'm writing and talking at the same time. The glucopyranose is in an equilibrium that hev heavily favors, yes, itself, but also the straight chain form. So since this is, this is important that this is an equilibrium, once we start reacting this, right, the concentration of this, albeit super duper low, crazy low, it starts to decrease because we're changing, we're transforming this into our reduction product. When that starts happening, yes, we are bringing back, and I'm probably going to spell this so terribly, with Chatelier's principle, which talks about equilibrium, right? And equilibriums, when they're disturbed, they try to counteract the change. So the change here is re a reduction in this concentration, right? In this equilibrium. So as this starts to disappear and turn into this product, the equilibrium, the, the, you know, the ring, the glucopyrino says, ah, dang, you know, we don't have as much of this as we're used to having. I will convert more of this into this. So basically, by doing the reduction, you start to convert cyclic forms of your sugar back to the Fischer projection form, the straight line form, which then just continues to get turned into the reduction product. So it's not this that you're reacting with. It's really the small amount of this that does exist, which starts to get depleted, which then gets replenished so you just keep draining the cyclic amount of stuff until you eventually have 100% of this right here. And I've seen this question asked like this before, but you know the same thing would also work with the oxidation, right? Like if we oxidize this and turns it into an, turned it into an oxidation product, that would upset this equilibrium as well. So just wanted to make sure I brought that up because I've seen it asked before. And if you see it now, then you're ready for it. Okay, gang, that really does do it for reduction of sugars. So if you're rocking with me on YouTube, thanks so much. I'm so glad you found me. Make sure to check out jochem.io. All these little videos, they have worksheets along with them and solutions. They're 100% free. You can check them out. They're just below the videos on my website. And if you're already watching from Jochem, then you're a real one. Thank you for tuning in. I hope to see you all in the next video.